This is CBC Here and Now. Two sisters, two lives lost to suicide. My husband died of a self-inflicted gunshot wound as well. A look at suicide in rural Newfoundland and Labrador. Bell Island Compromise. Politicians say there is a ferry deal. He's the top civil servant in Mount Pearl, but is he still playing politics behind the scenes? Well, it's going to feel a lot more November-like across the province over the next couple days, including chances for flurries, even accumulating snow. Details are ahead. He's now the top bureaucrat in Mount Pearl, but an email leaked to CBC suggests that former MHA Steve Kent is not quite ready to let go of his passion for politics. And he may be offering more than just moral support to the Tory candidate looking to fill his seat in the House of Assembly. Here now's Terry Roberts has been following this story today and he joins us now live from our newsroom. Terry, what more can you tell us? Uh, yeah, well, Anthony, we all know that Steve Kent loves a good political scrap. Well, now he's the chief administrative officer in Mount Pearl, that city's top bureaucrat. You would think he would be nonpartisan right now. Well, this email suggests otherwise. It was written Saturday, October 28th from Kent's personal email address to key players in Jim Lester's campaign to replace Kent as the Tory MHA in Mount Pearl North. It spells out plans on everything from a leadership team meeting and door knocking activities to potential endorsements for Lester. Type of message, the type of message you'd expect from a leading advisor. Not so, says Lester's campaign team. Nothing more than a friend helping a friend. Steve is certainly not giving direction to the team because we have a team here put together that makes decisions at the end of the day. The only comment I can make about that is, uh, you know, again, you've got a situation where you have uh, somebody who is, is friends with uh, somebody who's running uh, in the as a candidate. And, uh, you know, so he's providing some advice. Now, Kent is no uh, ordinary municipal administrator. Ten years as an MHA, cabinet minister, former deputy premier, but he shook up the political landscape in September, saying goodbye to elected politics. Now he's not breaking any rules by helping out on Lester's campaign, but he's making the new mayor in Mount Pearl a little uncomfortable. It worries me to cross the line whereby uh, if that type of work is being done uh, at the city of Mount Pearl, using city email accounts, or if that type of work is being done during office hours, if it happens on personal time or on the weekends, uh, I'm... Uh, I'm still concerned about it, but not as concerned as I would be if it was happening publicly. Now, provincial senior bureaucrats, well, they're prohibited from any uh, political activity, but this same kind of restriction doesn't extend to municipal administrators. Now, I spoke to, uh, I'm sorry, Kent would not agree to an interview today, but he did send us a message saying he's too busy right now in his new job to be involved in any political campaigns. Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Terry Roberts. An elderly man is dead after a fire ripped through a house in St. John's overnight. The body of a 93-year-old man was found inside this home on Mount Sio Road near Pippi Park this morning. Firefighters from three stations responded to the blaze just after midnight. The cause is under invest investigation, but police say it doesn't appear to be suspicious. The MHA for Bell Island says the ferry dispute could soon be resolved since Saturday protesters have been blocking the Legionnaire from departing for Fogo Island. David Brazel says the Department of Transportation has made an offer to the Ferry Users Committee that addresses the concerns of protesters and that committee is expected to make a decision on the offer later tonight. Residents facing a rent hike in St. John's may get a little more time. Last week, Here Now told you about a mother of five who says she is being forced to leave her low-income home on Forest Road after rent more than doubled. This after the city started basing rent on a tenant's income. Councillor Hope Jamieson now wants to give those affected six months' notice before the hike kicks in instead of the three months initially given. Jamieson says the city will also look at other social housing Housing corporations to compare pricing methods. And now to the Brandon Phillips murder trial. After a slow start, nine of 12 jurors have been chosen. Here and now is Fred Hutton is covering the case and he joins us live from our newsroom. Fred, uh, what's the latest? 
Anthony, well, it was a very long day. Another one for prospective jurors at Supreme Court as they try to start off the Brandon Phillips first degree murder trial. Just over 120 prospective jurors were summoned uh, back to court this morning to take part of the selection process. By 12.30, though, a process known as cause for challenge, only two jurors had been chosen after lunch, though. The process picked up a little bit. Another seven were selected to sit on the jury, which now consists of five women and four men. Phillips is charged with killing 63-year-old Larry Wellman during an attempted robbery at the Captain's Quarters Hotel in October of 2015. Wellman's daughter, Heather McGraw, who now lives in Houston, Texas, was in the courtroom today. She spoke with CBC News about two years ago after her father's death, at which time she said she was proud of her father for intervening in the robbery and trying to help. Now, the Crown and Defense have 75 potential jurors left to choose from. They need three more jurors and two alternates. They will all be back in court again tomorrow morning, so that means we could hear the first evidence in this case by tomorrow afternoon. Reporting live for Here and Now, Fred Hutton, CBC News, St. John's. This weather update is brought to you by the Take Charge Business Efficiency Program. Over 400 businesses have saved energy and taken charge of their bottom line. Find out how you can too. Our first look at the weather now with Ryan and what a temperature change today. Yeah, Big unreal. Uh, we woke up in the teens, uh, finished far from that. Uh, have a look. Here's the proof uh, with our temperature recap today. Starting at 6 a.m., 15 in St. John's, 15 in Gander, but watch the front as it moves through today and that temperature timeline uh, to your top right. You can see where we actually peaked at 17 in St. John's. And then as time went on, that front swung through, through the east. And yeah, by home time, 8 degrees. And currently, it's just 6 in St. John's, 2 in Gander, 2 in Corner Brook. At freezing in Happy Valley Goose Bay, minus 9 in Labrador City. And it certainly feels even cooler than that with the wind chill. Now, uh, there's the front, which is now pushed off to the east little bit of lingering drizzle still possible over the next hour or so, but generally it's a clearing trend across Newfoundland and Labrador. This is our next system, which is going to be tracking south of Nova Scotia and then into Newfoundland as we roll into the Thursday time period. Pretty quiet through tonight and tomorrow. Uh, note those winds in from the northeast. Some flurry chances along the northeast coast for tomorrow morning, so do keep that in mind as temperatures will be minus 2. Uh, Low-lying areas and inland areas of the Avalon and the Buren will also dip to as cool as minus 4 tomorrow morning, closer to the freezing mark near the coast. Minus 10 to minus 17 for inland areas of Labrador. As we move throughout the day tomorrow, a bit of cloud cover kicking up from time to time, but generally we're looking at a sun cloud mix. Temperature 3-4 degrees along the northeast coast, a little bit warmer, 5-6 to six degrees inland, and some flurry chances over the west coast of the island, again, in the morning primarily. We are looking at lots of sunshine and just a bit of cloud into the afternoon, Happy Valley Goose Bay, and some afternoon flurry chances in Labrador City as well. As we roll through uh, Wednesday night into Thursday, watch your timeline here, showers will move in. Uh, to the Avalon and eastern Newfoundland for Thursday. Winds in from the northeast. This is just going to be a raw November day. Certainly cool temps. Central Newfoundland, some sunny breaks and a sun cloud mix for western parts of Newfoundland with temperatures again, maybe five or six degrees here and minus three with more flurry chances on the menu for you folks in Labrador. Now, Thursday night, that system departs and actually a pretty quiet start to Friday, but not for long. Our next system is going to be moving in. We've got periods of rain set for Newfoundland as we roll into the late day Friday time period for the West Coast. And this is snow, which will turn to accumulating snow for you folks in Labrador for Friday night into Saturday as this next system really winds up. We'll talk more about this with your long range forecast and your seven day outlook in a little later on in the show. Here now has collected startling statistics on suicides in this province. From 2015 to 2016, the number of Newfoundlanders and Labradorians who took their own lives jumped by nearly 20 percent. And two of the biggest problem areas, the Buren Peninsula and Labrador West, were noted in these statistics. Here and now's Jeremy Eaton is on this story. Jeremy, what kind of numbers are we looking at? In 2016, Anthony, 73 people in the province took their own lives. The highest numbers? 27 people in St. John's, 8 on the rest of the Avalon Peninsula, 12 in Buren, Clarenville and the Bonavista Peninsula, and 11 in Labrador. 
At the end of 2016, it came to light that five people had ended their lives by suicide over an eight-month period in Labrador West, something the area's MHA says was a terribly sad time for the two communities. Health Minister John Hagee brought forth the issue and then vowed to work with the two towns. One of the things was to strike up a committee, the Labrador West Coalition. First thing we did uh, in conjunction with Labrador Grandfield Health, we hired four new positions for the mental health department to increase the number of clinics. In fact, we went to the point of offering walk-in clinics for people that they could walk in at any time and uh, you know, express their concerns and uh, to get treatment and to get the, uh, get the service that they require. And of course, there are some uh, issues regarding psychiatry services that uh, Labrador Grandfield Health is working on, public awareness and education, which are all important to promoting mental, mental health and uh, certainly the awareness and, and getting rid of the stigma that's attached to mental health, which, which does unfortunately still exist in some cases. A similar story down in the Buren area over a 14-month period. Six people on that peninsula took their lives. Mayor Rex Matthews spoke up about it, and he says Eastern Health has stepped up, adding resources, people, and money. It's pretty sad. You know, we've been through a very tough time, a very rough time. We understand as a community, too, that you know we can't have what they have in St. John's or Mount Pearl. The populations are different, but there's still a lot of services that can be delivered to smaller communities like Grand Bank. So our people have a fair chance. We need the accessibility. We need the accountability in terms of uh, mental health. Like, hey, you know, we can do better for our people. These are just two examples of areas struggling to deal with suicide. And speaking up about the issue seems to have, seems to have helped, or at the very least, got people talking about it. Anthony and Debbie? Thanks, Jeremy. Now, this evening, Here and Now is taking an in-depth look at suicide in the rural areas of our province, first by introducing it to two women with a painful personal story. But a story they want to share. And we'll discuss solutions with the province's health minister and a suicide counselor who has her own personal story.
Tonight, Here Now begins an in-depth look at a serious problem in our province, suicide. Earlier, Jeremy Eaton broke down some of the numbers for you. The number of people who are taking their own lives in parts of Labrador and on the Bonavista Peninsula is rising. And the same is true on the Buren Peninsula. We're going to introduce you now to two women in Grand Bank who share something terrible in common and a warning. Some of what they have to say is disturbing. Valerie, when did you first notice changes in your husband last year? Uh, probably, about a, probably about a week and a half, two weeks prior to his, his death that I noticed that he'd gotten really quiet, um, being cold, which is very odd for Leonard because he's never cold, um, just kind of withdrawn. And I used to keep asking him, are you okay, Leonard? And he would, he would always respond by saying, yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine. And his personality change came on quite quickly, right? Ex extremely. And I think probably the reason why I didn't focus on it as much is because I had just returned to work. In the summertime, I'm always off. So I see him all the time. So I had just went back to work the very end of August. And so I would come home and I think there was probably a little bit of cover up on his part trying to pretend that the day was okay. Or he would say to me, oh, you know, I lit around most of the day watching TV, uh, which was odd in some respects, but he was telling me this medication that he was taking for his stomach, you know, uh, was making him lethargic. So that seemed kind of normal to me. Right. And you think it's a possibility that some of his mood change was, in, was connected, even though we don't know this for sure, but possibly to this medication? Oh, I'm completely convinced, completely convinced. And especially because that medication now I'm aware of that uh, is associated with depression and suicidal ideologies. How did your husband come to take his own life and how did you find out this had happened? Um, on September the 20th of 2016, I got up for work as I normally did. I went into the room and I kissed him goodbye, I kissed his forehead, kissed his lips and said, I'll see you lunchtime and rubbed my cheek against his and went to work and said, I'll see you. And when I came back to my, actually before I got back in my driveway, my son had called to my, uh, my workplace in Fortune and said, is dad going somewhere? And I'm like, no. Well, I've tried to get hold of him and he's not answering the phone and he sent me a text. I said, he sent you a text? He said, yes, um, I love you very much. And I love him too, don't ever forget it, goodbye. And he followed by all kinds of, of hurts. So, of course, <laughs> I, I called and I got no answer. So I <laughs> jumped in my car really quickly and when I got to my driveway, my sister-in-law was there. And she told me she had heard a gunshot. And um, I walked up to the corner of my fence where my veranda met and I couldn't go any further. And I kept calling his name and he did Sir. <laughs> I want to give you a chance to, to, to get your breath because I know this is very difficult. The tragedy of suicide is obviously something that hits hard no matter where it happens, but here in Grand Bank this story takes on an even deeper sadness and I want to introduce you now to Valerie's sister, uh, Natalie. Natalie, I know that this is a difficult thing to talk about, but after Leonard took his own life, what happened in your situation? Uh, I took a month off of work and spent every waking moment with my sister. Um, I was given the information, I said, at my workplace, I work with healthcare and our local physician, our supervising physician, I said, um, brought me into a private room and told me. And the first comment I said was, you mean Lindsay? And he Lindsay said, being your my husband. husband, and he said, why would you say that? And I said, he's been battling for so long, and I've always worried in the back of my head that I would lose him that way. And he said, no, it was Leonard. And it took a moment for it to click, and I went, oh my God, Val needs me. And I bolted through the door, and I never left her side. And, and unlike, unlike Leonard, your husband, Lindsay, he had had 
struggles with suicidal thoughts? Yes. Um, he's had uh, been diagnosed for 18 years with uh, clinical depression and bipolar disease. Um, he's been medicated, uh, changed medications multiple times, seen psychiatry regularly, changed psychiatrist. We went to family counseling and marriage counseling. We even made a trip into the Waterford. What, what impact did Leonard's suicide have on your husband, do you think? Uh, Leonard was gone five weeks when Lindsay sat in bed to me one night, the way he always started his suicide talk was you and Josh would be so much better off without me. And we've had that talk so many times. And so many times I tried to tell him that this is not what I want. I've bargained, I've begged, I've pleaded. And I knew that he tried and fought so hard to stay. When he lost Leonard, he divulged to me several weeks later that he had seen Leonard's body accidentally. And I knew that this was a big problem in his mind because I said that was something that when you see it, you can't take it back. And so three months after Leonard took his own life? My husband died of a self-inflicted gunshot wound as well. He died December 17th, 2016, three days shy of three months after Leonard passed. We're going to take a break now, a chance to take a deep breath, and when we come back... We'll hear more from Val and Natalie about what kind of help and support is needed, and we'll explore solutions with Health Minister John Hagee and Suicide Specialist Tina Davies.
Welcome back to Here and Now. We'd like to welcome two guests, Health Minister John Hagee and Tina Davies, a suicide counselor. And thank you very much for joining us. We're going to talk about suicide solutions in just a few moments. But first, how do we explain the apparent spread of suicidal thoughts in rural areas of our province? Well, let's go back to Val Peach in Grand Bank for a moment. She has a teenage son, his name is Zach, and he had to deal with two deaths. First his dad's, then his uncle's. Knock on the bathroom door and there's no answer and it choked me. I knew, I knew what I had been feeling in my stomach. There was a reason for it. And I banged on the door again and he crawled to the door and he said, I'm sorry, Mom. I just took a pile of pills. And he had taken an overdose and it was lethal. Now, she managed to save her son, Zach, and uh, he appears to be doing quite well. So let's bring in Health Minister John Hagee and Councillor Tina Davies into this discussion. Tina, is there any such thing as suicide contagion? Well, a couple of things. When someone has lost someone to suicide, those surrounding that person who's died by suicide, their risk for doing the same thing themselves immediately goes sky high. Like I'm talking probably like 400 percent for at least a year. You have to you have to be careful and, and, and watch. That's why I do the work I do in postvention because it's very important. It's a form of prevention. And a couple other things. Um, if you wanted to ask somebody about suicide people would say, well, that might get them to start thinking about suicide. I don't think we're as easily influenced uh, by that as people like to think. I mean, if I asked you for, would you give me 25% of your salary for the next six years, what would you say? You're not easily that influenced by that, you know, by asking someone about suicide. So. I know it's been, re been reported in the media about suicide contagion, but I really think it's the it's the it's the ripple effect. It's the it's the what happens after. When we talk about suicide in a more general fashion, and Dr. Hagee, feel free to weigh in on this. Do we risk avoiding a really difficult part of the conversation, and that is that there are, for certain people. You, we can try to do as much as we want, as much counseling, as many medications, but at the end, just like someone who has cancer you come to a point where there's nothing more you can do. I think you've raised a very interesting point and, and I think the real the real boon of this piece of program is that we start a conversation because it is a sinister subject, it's an awkward subject, people don't want to talk about it and the real problem that a lot of communities have and a lot of people have is they simply don't know how to start that conversation and don't know how to get around that block and these kind of programs and this kind of material uh, is a start and that's the real crucial piece of today. Well let's get back to talking about uh, solutions to this uh, serious and obviously very challenging problem. Uh, first from Val and Natalie's point of view. When that cop came into the front garage and when she came in by herself, I knew instantly. And I said to her, he's dead, isn't he? And she said, yes. And I asked her what he did. She said, do you want to know? And she just put her finger to her temple. And I said, okay, I understand. And I said at his funeral, I said, don't wish him back. And everybody gasped. I said, I can't put him through that again. People think that suicide is a selfish thing. They have no idea. How do you cope with something like this? You know what, I can honestly say that we've held on to each other probably because we're going through the same thing. Even though, you know, the husbands, obviously the situation was a little bit different. Um, they both died the same way. But looking from the outside, people, you know, watching would think, what are the chances? <laughs> Two sisters who are very close in age, married to guys, for being, being involved with guys for three decades or more, or having this happen in such a short time frame, it would seem so unlikely. People yeah. are very blind, actually. Uh, people see what they want to see, and also the, the front that he always put on for everybody else. 
because the stigma still stays and people still are uneducated about what the disease entails mm -hmm. and they're still with this attitude that it was something that he could control which he could not. What kinds of supports are there in small places in Newfoundland for people who are struggling, whether it's the sudden onset of a mental problem or whether it's more long term as in your case? What, what's available? It's very, very limited. Uh, we have one psychiatrist. We've had two off and on, but because we're in a rural spot with very little resources, I said, they tend to leave. The statistics are increasing exponentially day by day. It is said that everyone will have a mental health crisis at one point in their life or know somebody who has. This is no different than having cancer or having diabetes. It is a disease. It is the responsibility of the province of our country, I said, to wake up. You've both been through so much. For people watching this interview who think of their spouse, their loved one, or their child, that they think, are they thinking things they shouldn't be thinking? What advice would you have for them? Don't wait. I said, continue to fight the fight. And you have to talk, and you have to continue to talk, and you have to make people understand. It's often said that um, people who find themselves in your situation where a loved one has, has decided to take their own lives suffer from a guilt. Did either of you experience that? Still do. <laughs> I, st I still, in some capacity, blame myself. But why? <laughs> I was... Because trying to... I, sh I knew him better than he probably knew himself. Mm -hmm. What did I miss? I should have known. Yeah. I should have known. Yeah. And well, we were the ones who knew them best. I watched him for 18 years and I went everywhere with them to try to make it better for him. If they don't start providing better resources than a three month waiting period or when you take your overdose a piece of paper with a two week or three week appointment or here's an app for your phone or here's the phone number I said for the mental health health line and I'm like well my husband promoted that but I doubt if he ever, ever used it. What you don't realize is when someone is vulnerable enough that they actually go to a doctor, it needs to be addressed at that very point in time. Because if you leave it for hours until they're sober or until um, the, the psychiatrist comes in, oh, I'm fine now, and off they go. Your misfortune is so great and your grief so obvious. Uh, my last question is, why Why are you willing to talk to me about this? I'm because, adamant for change. Yeah, because I'm, we've watched so many people suffer. So many. I can't help it that I'm sad. I lost my husband. But I've made choices and I've made some decisions and I'm not gonna stand by. And even in their deaths, I said, to let it go to waste. I said, I've become involved in a committee and it's been a, a new group. I said, it's a mental health, addictions and wellness. It involves our, our health care. Um, we're talking about RCMP and clergy and education because it has to start with education. It has to start with people understanding. We want to do a cultural change and the stigma has to leave. And we have to provide more supports for our loved ones who suffer in endless pain unnecessarily. Well, it's obvious these two sisters know firsthand what is needed. Uh, what's your reaction first to you, Dr. Haggy? Uh, again, it's a very difficult emotional situation and, and, and they, they present their case very well. I think the challenge that we have it goes back to my original comments around stigma. Um, we have recognized this through our policy development uh, as an issue uh, and they, they reference one of the things that has changed. There is now a community action group involved with folks such as themselves, healthcare providers and the like. We have gaps in mental health. The challenge is that a lot of people don't want to talk about mental health issues. Uh, we provide some services, we've increased services in the Buren area. There's no wait time in Grand Bank. People aren't going. 
the councillors are sitting there because people aren't going through the door. And the challenge there is how we engage people. And this kind of community effort worked well in Lab West when we had the problem there last November. Mm -hmm. And I think it's the best, uh, most promising feature uh, to, to, to come out of this. Now, you've been a busy person on the Buren Peninsula, and when we come back, we'll have a chance to talk about some of the things you've done there. We will continue discussing suicide solutions when we come back. Welcome back to Here and Now. Tonight, we've decided to put suicide in rural parts of our province under the microscope, and we've heard some heart-wrenching stories, and now we want to focus on some solutions with our two guests this evening. And my first question is, how is providing suicide prevention services different here in St. John's than it is in rural parts of the province? And you've been particularly busy on the Buren, as I mentioned before the break. Maybe you could start. Uh, I have been busy, but I think Dr. Hagee wanted to respond to this question. I mean, essentially, it's a challenge we have with any health care west of Bellevue, basically. We're a territory. So how do you deal with that? So we, we've tried to use technology, we've, and, and the app was referenced. But there are occasions where, obviously, face-to-face -face is important. And single-session drop-in counselling is something that we're very keen on uh, putting in to pretty well any community if we can do it. Uh, we've seen from Lab West and other areas where a single session, in actual fact, will deal with 50% of the issues. Very few people, in actual fact, do need to see a psychiatrist because of mental health issues. Obviously, in the case that was there, there was an individual with a very severe and refractory problem. Uh, and so we're trying to use a variety of toolkits. The younger people tend to work well with social media or, or with, with electronic connections. But for a certain age group, face-to-face -face can't be beat. And that's a challenge. Mm -hmm. Well, I just wanted to ask you, Tina, though, one of the sisters, Natalie, I believe, said that um, when somebody gets up enough nerve to go to a doctor and present with this problem, they need immediate help. She says they're not getting that. How important is that? It's extremely important. Now, you have to look at the doctors. Their waiting rooms are full. Most of the time, they aren't trained in any suicide intervention type of 
program. They're not assist trained. I do know that. Uh, that should be a requirement. So there's a specific program of training. Yes, yeah. that yeah, that teaches you how to recognize the signs of someone who has suicidal thoughts, to ask them if they are having those thoughts. Is that something that you've thought of addressing, Dr. Oh, Hagee? We actually have taken the ASSIST program and put it in Labrador in response to some of the, the issues that have been highlighted, and we put it down in Burin as well, and we're rolling it out. Yes. I mean, I think uh, Tina makes a very good comment. The first port of contact, I would think, for anybody who's having a mental health issue is a mental health worker. And, and to go to a family physician's clinic uh, where you have to get an appointment or you, you take a long list, and it, it's a very stressful time mm -hmm. and a very stressful uh, approach. We found, as I say, the single, the single visit drop-in, or at least the, the, the open access kind of walk-in clinics. Uh, and we put those in in Lab West, for example, uh, 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 over the weekend because Everything happens at five o'clock on a Friday. So we're looking at that, and, and in actual fact, Eastern Health is in the process of recruiting someone for this role, for this area. Uh, so um, it, it's, it, it's pieces of a puzzle that come together. I agree with you, Dr. Hagee, on the, the walk-in, because a lot of times, sometimes that's all a person needs, um, is somebody to listen to them, somebody to hear their story of how they got to having those suicidal thoughts. It's somebody who cares. Yeah. And if you ask them what your level of pain is when you, they first come in on a scale of one to 10, with 10 being the most, they will probably say nine or 10. But after you speak with them for a while, listen to them, hear their story, ask them again, and their pain has gone down to probably about a three or a four. Mm. Right there, you've, you've, you've changed a life right there. The stigma piece is crucial. We found that putting these walk-in clinics in malls or putting them in the basement yeah. of the Steelworkers Union in, in Lab City, they offered that for us, it works because people don't want to go to a building that has Central Health or Eastern Health logo yeah. on it because particularly in a smaller community, right. everyone points the finger and says, oh, he's got a problem. <laughs> and, and it's the stigma piece. And, and that's part of the barrier for people actually taking that first step. So make it more discreet. Yeah, and, and the, as, as the, the lady said on, on the, the, the cut you showed, the, the, the challenge is these people aren't doing it for selfish reasons. They're doing it because they see no other visible option. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're right, unfortunately. If you go back years ago, people who had a diagnosis of cancer wouldn't come out and talk about it because they all thought they were going to die. Mm -hmm. But we've dealt with that and the results have improved. And I think if you accept that premise, by putting in parallel kind of system for mental health, you will reduce the mortality from depression. Now, Tina, you and I spoke a year ago. Yes. We were talking about this very issue of stigma. Um, and you said you were hopeful because the discussion had started. A lot of people yes. are coming out. We have Amelia Kern and people yes. with profile like that. But then we hear, well, we hear Dr. Hagee talking about the issue, and we hear the sisters saying, there's still a lot of stigma. So really, how far have we come? Well, we have to persevere, Deb. We, you know, uh, it's, this is not going to change overnight, but it has changed in the last 10, 12 years. You hear more and more people speaking about mental health issues, actually saying the word suicide. It's coming, and we're just not going to stop working to change it and, and until that stigma is is eased because once the stigma is gone, people won't be as hesitant to reach out for help. But it's viewed as such a horrible social problem, whether you view it as a mental health problem, as a societal problem. When it comes to resources, you certainly down in Buren, heard people say you need to be uh, suicidal during business hours, sort of very cynical view of things, right? But is the solution money and resources? It can't be the only thing. No education, well, it's not the only thing. It's part of it. But education is a big thing. And like Dr. Hagee said, uh, we're doing the assist. I'm going back December. I'll be teaching the assist workshops to most of the hospital um, uh, personnel mm -hmm. in Marystown. Yeah. If you look at the, the, our implementation plan from a policy level, we're moving services across the province a low intensity, low barrier, whether it's mental health, whether it's addictions. So it won't be all 
institution-centered, it's community-based. And community organizations like that are going to be a key in rolling it out. It's worked extremely well in Lab West. It's not the perfect answer, but we're a lot further there than we are anywhere else. And now this is getting off the ground. I'm optimistic that people are going to start talking. And with healthcare budget the way it is, uh, which is not sustainable, um, are you working towards more creative and less expensive options that may just work? We're looking at value. What we have said in our all party implementation, we spend less than the Canadian national average as a proportion of our health budget on mental health. We have stated that we will change that percentage and effectively nearly double it in five years. Uh, we will do that by spending money on the things that work and not spending money on the things that don't. We've actually been very successful with the health budget in actual fact. Our, our, our figures for the total health expenditure are almost the same for the last two years. Right. We're running out of time. I can yeah. only give you a brief bit I of... I just want to make a, a quick note. You know, we can't, always, we can't always expect the government to give us everything. We have to take the bull by the horns. We have to educate. When, when there are workshops in your town, show up let's 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 get educated we can we get by with a little help from our friends we have to take care of each other we're only we are one race we t we're here we're all connected we have to take care of each other you know it's not it can't always be right. government 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 not not saying that we don't <laughs> like a little <laughs> cash coming our way you know but still right. that's it's we're all in this together and when we know better, we do better. I think that's a good place to, to wind things yeah. down. Excellent. Um, yes. Thank you both very much for coming on here now tonight. Oh, thank you. It's a great conversation, really important. Thank you. Oh, yeah.
Let's meet our young athlete of the day. This is Sydney Smith of St. John. Sydney is nine and loves cheerleading. Yeah, and Sydney and her team won two silver medals in the Newfoundland Labrador Provincials and at the Cheer Expo in Halifax with Max Force Typhoon. And she's currently working on perfecting her back tuck. Congratulations, Sydney. You're today's young athlete of the day. <laughs> You were out and about today? Yes. Once as again. usual on Absolutely. Tuesday. Absolutely. All right. Try to hit as many uh, grade five classes as I can when they do the weather unit, of course, in grade five. And today I was in CBS at Villanova Junior High. Clearing continues across the island tonight. <laughs> Two and below freezing tomorrow morning. Sun and cloud on Wednesday, but still chilly. Quiet Thursday, and our next system moves in Friday. Questions once again. Uh, a lot of talk about tornadoes today, uh, and they always, of course, love uh, watching uh, some of the videos that I shot down in Oklahoma a couple years ago. Uh, but a great class, and uh, they listened. Uh, uh, they were perfect, really. Perfect. Right. Well, it's great. Pretty close to perfect. Yes. <laughs> uh, so thanks again to uh, to Villanova Junior High in CBS. And one of the things we did talk about today was uh, temperature contrast, and that often gets the winds gusting. A little gusty this morning as we had. 17 degrees 17. The high. I couldn't believe yeah. it when I opened up the door. <laughs> yeah, and uh, as you walk out the door after the show, yeah. it's going to be, oh, because uh, here's where we are now. Five degrees in St. John's, two in Gander, one in Corner Brook, minus nine in Labrador City, and uh, that front is well offshore now. And as we take a look over the next, uh, well, the weather setup first, there's the front that has pushed offshore. This is our next weather system off to the south and west, and it's going to be moving in through the overnight hours tonight for the Maritimes, and we'll uh, track into eastern parts of Newfoundland as we roll into the Thursday time period. Here's how it all plays out. That front again continues to depart. It's a northerly wind through tomorrow. Area of high pressure keeps things pretty quiet. Bit of cloud kicking up over uh, parts of the island, mainly the south coast tomorrow, where uh, I think from Harbor Breton back towards Port of Basque, it's a mainly cloudy day. Isolated flurries in the morning along the west coast. Again, sun cloud mix elsewhere, just a little on the cool side. In fact, temperatures will be below freezing across most of Labrador again for tomorrow. There's that low that is again back in the forecast as it'll be tracking a little bit further to the west and will bring shower chances into eastern Newfoundland on Thursday. The Avalon, the Buren, Clarenville, Bonavista, not sure it will make it into Gander and Grand Falls, Windsor, where I have mainly cloudy skies, but obviously keeping a close eye on this forecast over the next 24 hours. Looking at temperatures in the low single digits for uh, most of Labrador, the exception Lab West, where we'll again be a below freezing. And by Friday, it's increasing clouds across most of the island, perhaps some early morning drizzle for the Avalon, looking at again some sun breaks possible in central and our next system approaching. The winds increasing through the day on Friday, some late afternoon rain possible Port of Basque and up towards Corner Brook, and we are looking at snow tracking in to Labrador City. And again, this system will really wind up through the day on Friday. Winds increasing in strength and some snow and blowing snow possible on the coast of Labrador on Saturday. Uh, the snow will actually taper off through Saturday in Labrador City, where I think the heaviest snowfall potential will be for Friday night for you folks. Saturday, again, a pretty blustery day in Happy Valley Goose Bay as well. And the setup for Saturday, which is, of course, Remembrance Day, does look like onshore flurries and some gusty winds along the west coast of the island and perhaps some of those flurries tracking as far inland as central Newfoundland, maybe even the south coast with a, uh, a flurry or squall and eastern Newfoundland not looking too bad after some morning showers. High pressure will duck in uh, with a bit of a clear out for Sunday and then another system to watch for Tuesday of next week as things stay active. And so here's a quick look at that seven day trend. Again, Remembrance Day clearing in the east with a flurry chance in central and uh, the west coast not looking so great right now, but we'll keep an eye on this. Obviously Sunday looking like a better day for sure into Monday and again that system approaching for Tuesday of next week and in Labrador we are watching again that potential for that snowmaker moving in on Friday. Some mixing uh, with uh, some snow for Friday night into Happy Valley Goose Bay lingering into Saturday and that cold air certainly rushing in behind this system. We'll have your uh, we'll keep you posted on this over the next couple of days. Debbie. 
Thanks very much, Ryan. Some news out of Labrador to tell you about. The airfield in Happy Valley Goose Bay is closed tonight. This after snow removal operators experienced issues driving on the runway. Yeah, military officials at Five Wing Goose Bay say all fixed wing flights were stopped as of 5 p.m. So aircraft, helicopters probably still landing. Planes, jets, no. And a certain number of Air Canada flights scheduled to land at the airport this evening. They've been scrapped. We've got more information on our website. Check it out, cbc.ca slash nl. And our viewer picture of the day is a beautiful one at sunset and almost looks like a painting. Can you guess this location? Uh, give you a little bit of a clue. It's on the island. The oh, details. Big clue. Well, it's a beauty wherever <laughs> it is. <laughs> After the break. And welcome back once again. Well, Nova Scotia designer Tabitha Osler is proving plastic can be fashionable as well as functional by creating kids' clothing out of recycled plastic bottles. Yeah, the line that uh, is being made includes raincoats, pants and hats that are waterproof. And the idea is that as they get worn out, these clothes, they get older, uh, they can actually be recycled again into new items. And Osler <laughs> is taking orders now and hopes to uh, kick manufacturing into high gear next January. I think we could use some of that here. Yeah, you think? Yeah. <laughs> we get a little bit of rain. We need a snodden line. Yeah. Oh, I yeah. Really well, well, let's yeah, talk I to like uh, yeah. retirement. <laughs> talk to a backer, maybe. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, so before the break, we had our viewer picture. I didn't give much of a clue. You're no, right. it was uh, tough. Yeah. What about uh, South Coast? There's a better clue. South Coast. And if you're watching closely with the picture, again, another clue here. You can just see on the edge on the right hand side, Route 210. Oh. If you happen to know where that is, uh, again, uh, this is a pretty tough one. I love this picture, though, and we uh, are zoomed down to the uh, northern northwest part of uh, the Buren Peninsula, Harbor Mill. Hmm. Ah. I've never been there. It's a beautiful and, spot. Yeah, it's what gorgeous. A, definitely a beautiful picture. Like one of those uh, pictures you would paint in, uh, in elementary school, at least I did. Pictures <laughs> you like were a very this. talented little well, kid there, yeah. Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it didn't look just like this, but uh, uh, anyway, a beautiful uh, sunset. <laughs> uh, pictures like this, you know, with yeah. the, the, the color, uh, watercolors. Uh, when, yeah. this, when this show's over, I'm getting on the phone. I'm going to get your mom to send me a fax. I want proof. Yeah, <laughs> nothing anywhere close to that. Uh, yeah. 
Well, thanks for the gorgeous picture. Yes. And thanks to all of you for watching. Have a great night and see you tomorrow. Foot in mouth. <laughs> Good night. <laughs>